All right, good morning, family. How's everybody doing today? My wife just called me bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, happy Easter Sunday. Happy Resurrection Sunday. You know, it's not about the bunny. It's about the lamb. So my name is David, and I am the man that's standing in between you and that food, so I'll try not to take too long. <laughs> title of my lesson is the beginning and the end. You know, Jesus lived a pretty amazing life. Started off kind of crazy. Uh, he was born and uh, the king was jealous and wanted him killed at birth because there was a prophecy said that he would become king. So that a lot of little children died at Jesus' birth. He, he lived a life, an incredible life. He helped people. He healed people, he spoke the truth, and he loved everyone. And he was brutally and horrifically murdered. The Jews, the religious leaders at that time, they just didn't like him, you know. Uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 11. I want to go into a little bit why they didn't like Jesus first, before we talk about the incredible good news of the resurrection. Luke chapter 11, you know, we said he spoke the truth, and like Jesus never told a lie. You imagine that? Never like exaggerated, never like had a little gray lie or a, a fib or whatever. He always told the truth. Amen. Told us exactly what we needed to hear. Luke chapter 11, verse 47, Jesus speaking to the religious leaders. This is, kind of, this is the kind of stuff that ticked them off. Verse 47, it says, Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you prove of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that had been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. Then Jesus left there. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. So we have here an example of some just some kind of nasty people, really, when you think about it. You know, their, their forefathers were murderers, and Jesus is saying that you guys are responsible for this too. And when you really think about it, uh, the idea of Christianity and of following Jesus is very unpopular in the world today, in a lot of places. And why is that? Why is it so unpopular? Well, a lot of it's unpopular because of the way that, quote-unquote, Christians treat people around them. And the hypocrisy that they have. Just, Jesus was calling them out on their hypocrisy, on their treatment of other people. That you guys make it hard to follow God's laws. Woe to you. You persecute people who tell you the truth. And you, in turn, lead others astray. When you think about it today, that's a lot what happens. You know, I can, I can attest for myself that in my, in my life, I've, I've gone to church on Sunday and lived a pretty crazy life throughout the rest of the week just doing whatever I wanted and with a lot of selfishness and greed. And my life, the consequences for that was really bad. And I was a religious hypocrite for a long time. But it, praise God, through the scriptures and through my relationship with Jesus, I was able to change that I'm by no means a perfect person, but my life is so much better as I do my best to reflect on what Jesus did for me and to live my life a certain way. So religious people, rather than being confronted with these scriptures and changing their life, they said they decided to want to kill the messenger. And that's exactly what they did. They arrested him, had a sham trial in the middle of the night and murdered him. Brutally murdered him from his, in front of his friends and in front of his family, his own mom. Watched him die, horrific death. But of course, we're here to talk about the good news, right? The good news is that he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. What does that mean for us today? You know, when Jesus was crucified, everyone thought it was the end, when you really think about it. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were fired up to go back to their hypocrisy unhindered. The Romans, they were fired up too. They could go back to their pagan idolatry without any more hassles from the Jews. Disciples even, they went back to their old way of life. They're thinking that Jesus' death was the end for them. And that maybe they had just wasted three years of their lives. Of course, Jesus' mother would no doubt be in mourning and preparing for his funeral. 
I imagine that even Satan and his demons thought it was the end. Yes, we finally killed this guy that's supposed to be the savior. We influenced people. We worked hard, guys. We did a great job, and they actually killed him. This is the end of this religion. Everyone thought it was the end. Everyone's right, too, in one sense. It was the end of certain things, but it was also at the same time the beginning of even better things. Point number one, the end of tears. Turn to John chapter 20. I'm going to go through the resurrection account in the book of John. You know, losing someone that you love can cause sadness that can't be described. Over the years, I've had about maybe about five or six of my really good friends that I grew up with fall on hard times and take their own lives. And the sadness that you experience losing someone close to you, whether it's that way or another way, it can be very sad. It can be very hard to deal with. And it can't even be put into words sometimes, the grief that we can feel in losing someone close to us. Let's, sort of, let's look at John chapter 20, and we'll see how it plays out here for Mary Magdalene, verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus says, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary de Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things to her. Can you imagine this scenario? Mary just watched Jesus get brutally killed. And she is filled with grief and loneliness and sadness from a man that had saved her from death. From the consequences of her wicked sin, he had rescued her. And she had spent the three years with him there. And now he was gone and murdered. And she went to his tomb to just go check it out. And the tomb, the stone is rolled away, this huge heavy stone. She looks inside, there's two angels in there. She kind of probably doesn't know what's quite going on yet. And then Jesus appears to her. And she thinks he's a gardener or something, you know. And, uh, and she's like kind of befuddled. And Jesus says, uh, he just like preaches the best, you know, Jesus can preach a great sermon with just one word. Mary. <laughs> and she's like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus, you know. <laughs> See, you realize here she was lonely, she was sad, she was depressed, thought she had lost Jesus forever, for, for a good, for all time. And he probably, most likely, he appeared to her in a different form, that's why she didn't recognize him. But more importantly, she was not expecting to see him walking around alive and well. Right? If, when you, if you see someone die, you're not you're like be very surprised to see them walking around again. When I was a lifeguard, we do CPR on people after a few minutes and they start breathing again, and that's pretty cool. But like three days, that's a big, that's a big difference. Three days later. Jesus is walking around. And Jesus here, he doesn't reveal himself to Mary by telling her who he is. He reveals himself to her by telling her who she was to him. And the reality of it is this is the first person that Jesus appeared to. He appears to Mary, a sinful woman of the past, her past life. And he, Jesus here, he tells us that when we are with him, when we have Jesus in our life, we don't have to cry tears of sadness. We don't have to be lonely. We don't have to be depressed. And we don't ever have to give in to despair. And that's the beauty of having a relationship with Jesus. That's the beauty of being able to spend time with Jesus. Well, I love the amazing relationships that I get to have in the church. Uh, the different people, the different people in my lives are so fulfilling. It brings me so much joy. I love watching the children at our Bible study group at my house on Friday. Sometimes we'll have 10 or 15 kids. The children are all just tweaking out and playing with each other and having so much fun. And you can just see the joy they have in their relationships with each other. And it's so satisfying to watch. My son, Luke, he had his sixth birthday a couple of weeks ago. And there was 20 kids in my yard doing slip and slide and, and trying to take me out with water balloons. But just these memories that our, our kids are building, the amazing relationships 
and the great joy that it brings through our relationship with each other and our relationship with God. And that's the beauty of awesome relationships. See, the reason why there are so much tears and so much sadness and so much depression and so much despair and so much suicides in this world is because people just don't have amazing relationships, not only with Jesus, but with each other. The Bible says that when we walk in the light, we can have fellowship with God and we can have fellowship with each other. We have fulfilling and joyful relationships to help us get through this sometimes obnoxious life. The relationships that we have are so important. I love my relationships with the Bartholomews, having them as my neighbors. You know, I, I, can, I, can, I can leave my house and know that my neighbors are not going to come break into my house and rob me. <laughs> we can leave our kids with each other and know that the kids are going to be okay. Having amazing relationships. I know that if, if I'm having a problem in my marriage, if, if Beth is getting kind of irritated with me because maybe I'm being a little bit harsh or maybe I'm being unloving to my wife, that she can make a phone call and I can have a brother like Robbie or Chris Call me up and see what's going on and help us with our relationship. And that's the beauty of having a relationship with Jesus and other people that have a relationship with Jesus. You know that people can literally see Jesus today and not recognize him. And that's why I go back to saying that there's so much sadness in the world. They don't realize that what we have here, the family that we have here, the relationship that we have with Jesus is the solution to the sadness and the loneliness. In this church, you should never feel a moment feel lonely like you're all on your own and no one can help you or no one wants to help you because we have a relationship with Jesus and a great relationship with each other. You know, I can see Jesus' life lived out in my wife by the amount of patience she has, the amount of love she has for the sisters around her, for our family. I can see, I can see Jesus in the life of my brothers and sisters in this very church here, and I love it. And it's what, it's what really keeps me going because I can go there in my thoughts. I can, go, I can get down, I can get sad, I can, I can have a martyr syndrome, a, a woe is me syndrome. I can get that way. But I know that when I talk to people around me and I see the joy and I get to watch the kids, I can imagine them out there in the field taking each other out to get those eggs out there. It's going to be super fun to watch. <laughs> because Jesus is here with us today. No one has taken him. He is not hidden. You can find him. You can find him in the scriptures. You can find him in the great relationships that you have with each other. You can find Jesus if you really want to. The resurrection means the end of tears and the beginning of joy. Joy in a relationship with Jesus and joy in a relationship with each other. Point number two, the end of fears. The fear of pain and death can cripple and incapacitate people. Check out John chapter 20 and verse 19. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb. Wait, sorry. Verse 19. I need thicker glasses. There we go. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hand and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, what's happening here is... Jesus' followers, they saw visually what happened to Jesus. He was whisked away in the night and beaten and tortured and murdered. And they saw that. They saw that happen. He was taken from them, right? And so they're afraid. And who wouldn't be afraid? <laughs> the guy you're following just got murdered. And so what they do, they go and hide. They shut themselves in and they shut the world out. Locked up in their house. They're afraid of being persecuted. They're afraid of the, of the death of being, of, of being crucified to death of being beaten and whipped and tortured. Of course they'd be scared. Who wouldn't be scared? What I love about Jesus here, he doesn't come with harshness. He doesn't show up rebuking them or laying them out for abandoning him. Why would you guys leave me? Why did you guys do that to me? I thought you were my friends. He didn't guilt trip them. He didn't shame them. He said, peace be with you. Jesus offers peace. 
Even when we totally mess up and abandon him, he offers us peace. Jesus told me you have peace and you'll have forgiveness. You'll have forgiveness for your wrongdoings. You can have a place to come where you'll be criti criticized and looked down on and shamed and guilted when you've messed up. You'll have peace and you'll have forgiveness. You know, people respond differently to, diff to, uh, to danger in different ways, right? There's a fight or flight thing. And I think the most, um, the most vivid illustration of that is in, in the war, in combat, right? Uh, so I have a really good friend. He's a, he's a veteran of the uh, Afghanistan war. And so he was uh, on patrol. Uh, through a village in Afghanistan. You had a whole truck, a line of armored cars, uh, the Humvees, right? They had bulletproof glass and, and bulletproof walls and stuff like that, big machine guns all over them. But they, ex they encountered an ambush. And some people cut them off and trapped them in there. And the whole village started attacking them and shooting at them and stuff like that. So they got into this big firefight in the middle of this village. And so the soldiers here, some of them, this is their first time in combat. Some of them already experienced combat in the past, right? So some of the soldiers calmly picked up their weapons to expel the enemies and were shooting off the bad guys, right? Some of them, other of them, are, were panicking and trying to run away and escape because they were afraid of all the bullets. One guy in particular, I was, he told me about it, his lieutenant, he's like their leader. He curled up into the bottom of the floor of the truck and started screaming and covered his, heads with his, eyes, covered his eyes with his arms because he was just so afraid. He was paralyzed with fear. So people would respond to it differently, it's fight or flight, either you run and hide or panic and freak out, or you calmly deal with the situation in front of you. Right. So the, the apostles, the disciples here, they're afraid, so they kind of just ran away and shut themselves in. And fear can do that to us. Fear of persecution, fear of, of death. You know, it's amazing here, the Bible says that Jesus breathed on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. They were afraid, but Jesus breathed his Holy Spirit into them, and that was what gave them courage. That's what gave them boldness. That's what made them brave because they're filled with Jesus' Holy Spirit. And they saw the miracle of him returning and, they, and made them strong and made them faithful. When the Holy Spirit comes on us, we have great authority and confidence. You know, God, God breathed his spirit into Adam, the very first man. You can also read Ezekiel's account in the Valley of Dry Bones where God breathed into a whole army for him. God's Holy Spirit is powerful. And so this is pretty cool for us today. We can have that same Holy Spirit. Like that same Holy Spirit from thousands of years ago that we're reading about here that made these men and women so brave. We can have that Holy Spirit within us. When we have faith, when we repent and we get baptized, God says, I promise you, I'll give you my Holy Spirit. That very same Holy Spirit. It's not a different Holy Spirit. It's not a different God. It's the same God with the same Holy Spirit that can fill us with faith and fill us with courage. Jesus here tells them that you guys can even forgive people their sins and they'll be forgiven. And if you don't, they won't be forgiven. It's not that man can grant repentance, but man can declare repentance proven by your deeds. You see it lived out in the apostles' lives later throughout the book of Acts. If you read through the amazing and courageous things they did to spread the gospel message of Christianity around the world. Filled with God's Holy Spirit and boldness. Jesus says, as my Father sent me, now I send you. He's telling us the same thing. See, Jesus was not sent as a philosopher like Plato or Aristotle, though he knew higher philosophy than all of them. Jesus was not sent as an inventor or a discoverer, though he could have invented new things and discovered new lands. Jesus was not sent as a conqueror, although he was mightier than Alexander or Caesar. Jesus was sent to preach and to teach. Jesus was sent to live among us. Jesus was sent to suffer for truth and righteousness. Jesus was sent to rescue mankind. And he says, I'm sending you for the very same reasons. To help people, to heal people, to bind people that are bound up in sin. To bind them up with his Holy Spirit. So I want to challenge everybody, don't be afraid of anything. Fill, God's, fill your life with God's Holy Spirit. And you'll have no room for fear in you at all. See, Satan is going to try and take you out and get you to doubt and get you to be afraid and get you to be distracted from the truth. I want to challenge you to bind up your brothers' and sisters' wounds, pick up your weapon, and start shooting back. There are still battles to be fought, although the war is won, because when Jesus rose from the dead, he defeated sin. He defeated death but there's still battles to be fought out there there are still people that don't have God's Holy Spirit in them and they're afraid and we need to cast out doubt and fear 
The resurrection means the end of fear and the beginning of peace. Point number three, the end of doubts. You know, some people really like, I need to see it to believe it kind of attitude. Check this out in John chapter 20, in verse 24. The Bible says in verse 24, Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand to his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who those have not seen and yet have believed. So Thomas here has this kind of an intellectual doubt. It's like, I got to see it. I get you guys are talking about Jesus come back. That sounds impossible to me. Why would it sound impossible? Because it is impossible. <laughs> and, and he says, come here and put your hand inside this hole in my side where, where they speared me. That sounds to me kind of gross, but I don't know. Just, just, maybe it's just me. <laughs> but he needed some evidence here, you know. Thomas was probably a really smart guy. But he's known for the rest of his life, from this interaction, he's known for the rest of his life as Doubting Thomas. Like he gave himself a bad rip. A lot of people don't know this about Thomas, that he actually went on to evangelize Spread the gospel mes message of Christianity all over the country of India. Like he evangelized India, doubting Thomas. That's what he's, that's, he's still known for that. Wow. You know, it's kind of funny, but he was actually, he actually uh, evangelized that whole country and got killed with a sword when he was an old man. And now they have a statue of him in India to this day. Uh, seeing it to believe it. Yeah, I, you know, you got, there's different conspiracy theories out there. You can go on the internet and you can find, like you can couple clicks away for some pretty crazy ones, right? And so uh, they, got, they got flat earth, uh, you got uh, hollow earth, there's one that oh. believes that there's a civilization inside the center of the earth, right? You got uh, aliens, conspiracies out there, uh, all these different things. Uh, you, know, you learn about evolution in school, and it's like, oh, I don't know about that, you know, these different things. I need to see it to believe it, you know? And uh, I, was, I was talking with a friend of mine, he's like really into the flat earth thing, like he's like, NASA is the devil. The earth is flat. They've been lying to you all this time. And, I'm, and for me, I'm not going to get into those kind of arguments. Like, I was just like, well, you know what? Maybe you're right. Like, I, ha I can say, honestly, I have not ever seen the globe, you know, from a distance. I haven't got in a plane. I haven't flew around the earth. Uh, I can see the horizons, and I've traveled a little bit here. But I haven't gone to the other side of the planet. Uh, you know, there's, apparently there's an ice wall if you get too far enough out or something like that. I haven't seen that either, you know. So I, I'm just saying, I don't know. Like, but here's the thing, right? If I die... And I'm right with God. And uh, God says, yeah, the earth was flat. He was right. You were wrong. <laughs> like, okay, amen. At least I'm in heaven though, right? So it doesn't really matter if the earth's flat or hollow or whatever. <laughs> if God chose to evolve us from uh, ape-like creatures into humans, that's his prerogative. That doesn't matter. And the reality too is like, yeah, the Great Wall of China, I've never actually seen it. I, I suppose it's there. I saw pictures of it. But the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, now that's important. Like this flat earth stuff, not so important. Jesus' resurrection, that's very important. Because if Jesus, that, if that didn't actually happen, then we're all totally wasting our time here right now. Like totally wasting our time. If that didn't happen, it's pointless. This is all pointless. You might as well just go do whatever we want. So it is important that we understand that we have, there is evidence that is very important. Yeah. Romans chapter 1 verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So there's got to be evidence for us to believe what we're believing, or we'll, be, or we'll be making excuses to not follow Jesus. See, there's no excuse at all not to believe. All we have to do is open our eyes and look around, right? We can look around at this beautiful creation, all the trees, our beautiful children, and each other, and how incredible and intricate God had made all of us. And that's excuse right there for the creation. But the resurrection, that's a different story. That's a quite a hard one to believe right there. Someone walking out of a tomb after three days. There are three truths that would have to be debunked for the resurrection to not be true. Number one, a group of women found Jesus' tomb empty on the third morning after Jesus' crucifixion. We'd have to debunk that for it to not be true, right? So, here's some, a couple of tidbits I found on the internet. Earliest arguments by the Jews against Christianity admit 
that the tomb was indeed empty. In Matthew chapter 28, it says they started a conspiracy theory in which they blamed Jesus' followers of stealing the body, admitting that the tomb was indeed empty. There's a doctor that wrote, this is called positive evidence from a hostile source. In essence, if a source admits a fact that is decidedly not in its favor, the fact is genuine. So much more evidence of this. Women's testimony back then was considered worthless. So why would they have made this up using women's testimony? Why not make it more believable like using only the testimony of the men? Why would they do that? This is unbelievable that they would use women, and yet it is so. Also, there was no shrine ever made at Jesus' grave, which was customary at the time. No bones, no shrine. Literally, none of this adds up at all. There's a forgery known as the Gospel of Peter. It was written in 125 AD. And this, in this gospel, this forgery, it said there's three men came out of the tomb with their heads reaching to the clouds, followed by a talking cross. That's what a fabricated legend looks like. That's what a lie looks like. This is what the truth looks like here in the Bible, and that's the evidence of it. Second thing that would need to be debunked. Jesus' disciples had real experiences with one whom they believed was the risen Christ, but it wasn't necessarily him, right? So let's check out 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I think it's important that we have evidence. And it's hard with something 2,000 years ago that happened. Verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he had raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So here Paul has what would be known as a, uh, an ancient creed of an eyewitness account. Now, <clears throat> just because the disciples think that they saw Jesus does not mean that it was true. One of these three things that have to be true here. They were lying, they were hallucinating, or they really saw Jesus. If they were lying, why would so many of them willingly die as martyrs? Yeah. See, it's very true that men would die for a lie that they believe is true. But no one, and I mean no one, would die for a lie that they knew was a lie. It just, it just wouldn't make any sense. These, these disciples, they went on to spread the gospel message of Christianity, and they died never denouncing it. How many people heard of Watergate? It's a scandal, a political scandal back in the 70s. It's kind of a, the older people think, oh yeah, I heard about that one. So it's, just, it's a scandal that happened where the president at the time uh, got some people to spy on his political opposition, and they got busted. Right? And so these 12 men uh, back at this time during Watergate were trying to cover this thing up for a couple of weeks. Someone wrote about it. It says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate, on the other hand, embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. So were they hallucinating? Saw something that they thought was real. They said they ate with him, they drank with him, and they touched him. And over 500 people saw that same hallucination? I don't think so. Hallucinations are highly individual occurrences, and they're never group manifested. Third, third fact, as a result of the preaching of these disciples, which had the resurrection at its very center, the Christian church was established and grew to spread around the world. The early Christians believed so strongly that they evangelized the planet in their lifetime. What was the origin of their belief? Well, they didn't borrow their ideas from pagan religions, which are not prevalent in the area of Palestine in the first century. Christianity started like this. After a public ministry, Jesus was killed publicly. He rose from the dead in a public tomb publicly. He then publicly showed himself to the public. The public then told everyone what they saw. That's how Christianity started. How do other religions start? 
They always trace back to one person, almost every time. Have a private dream about God or a private angelic encounter about God of a private idea about God. And that first person tells everyone what they saw or heard. That's not how Christianity started. It's the opposite. There's only one explanation. They think they saw the risen Lord because they saw the risen Lord. <laughs> so what does that mean for us today? Now that I've convinced you. <laughs> Jesus says in John chapter 20, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who have seen me and, not, and, and yet have believed. He's talking about us in this room. We didn't see this, and yet we can believe it. And I think that everybody in this room right now, I would say, for the, I would say almost guaranteed, I don't know everybody here. I see some new faces. But I would say that everybody believes that someone named Jesus lived. And he was an awesome guy. Maybe we might be skeptical about the resurrection. I don't know. But if we are professing Christians, living a repentant life, baptized disciples of Jesus, and we say that without a doubt, we believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead. All I have to ask, is your life reflecting that belief in everything that you do? Because if you do, you'll be blessed, like Hayden said in his contribution message. So are you looking for evidence or are you looking for excuses? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christianity is centered around this, and nothing is more important or profound than that. I'm going to challenge everybody here, if you're visiting, uh, to set up a Bible study with the person who invited you. And see what it really means to believe and have faith in what Jesus did for you. And how to behave, uh, how to act your life out in response to what Jesus did for you. Closing out here in John chapter 20, verse 30. The, flag, uh, the fly shusher is going to get a sore arm if I don't hurry. <laughs> Verse 30, the Bible says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his, of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name having a life in jesus's name that is the goal that's that's what we're that's what we're fighting for that's what we're struggling towards having life in jesus's name responding to the truth of his scriptures with faith and obedience for the rest of our lives you know i can talk about the miraculous things that i've seen in my life because you can read about these miracles and even at the end of the book it says that jesus has uh, has has done so many miracles that there are not enough books in the whole world to write it all down. And I can imagine when we get to heaven, we can ask Jesus to tell us all the cool stories about the awesome miracles that, he's, that he performed that, we, that aren't written about. Because some of the things that are written in here are pretty cool. Like walking on water and raising people from the dead and healing lepers. That's pretty amazing. Imagine that. Like for me, I got, I got tons of surfing and fishing stories, but like these are like really cool stories. These <laughs> miracles, you know. <laughs> when we get to heaven, we can talk about it. But the miracle in my life that I can say that I can attest to, that, that I know really happened, and it can't be made up, it's too crazy to be made up. Like my life before knowing Jesus, before having his Holy Spirit live inside of me, my life before that was a total catastrophe, a complete and total catastrophe. I was on the way to ruining my second marriage with my beautiful wife here. I was addicted to drugs and alcohol, I was in and out of jail, and I was homeless before I knew Jesus. When I met Jesus at the waters of baptism and got his Holy Spirit living inside of me, my life radically changed. It's so much different. There's still ups and downs. But I have an awesome family around me. I have an awesome Bible guiding me and incredible examples of Jesus' life. That is indeed a miracle for me. When Jesus took away my sins, when he washed them away, and he forgave me for the terrible rotten things that I've done and the, and the, and the, and the tons and tons of hurt that I've caused people. And I was able to be forgiven of that. And that's the, that's the power of Jesus' resurrection right there. And I can attest to that in my life. And, and I don't know where everybody's at today, what you're going through, what's happening in your life. But I can, I can promise you, I'll make this promise to you. If you commit and give your life totally and completely to Jesus and have faith in, in these things that he's teaching us. If you truly believe that, and if you put it into practice, you can have this too. You can have an awesome and joyful life.
My last passage, I promise, Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 4. <clears throat> he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He's talking here about heaven. And the, the amazing thing about heaven is something we don't know, we haven't experienced, we haven't seen it, but we can have a taste of it right here and right now here on earth. See, Jesus' resurrection shows us what heaven is going to be like. No tears, no fear of death, and no doubt about who Jesus is. And being a part of God's kingdom, being a part of his church here on earth, it's the little sample of that. That's what it really is. It's a little sample of that. And all our hardships are... Becoming a Christian doesn't mean all the traffic lights are going to be green. doesn't mean that your student loan is going to disappear and your mortgage is going to be gone. doesn't mean that. But it means that you can have a meaningful, fulfilling life here on earth. Being a part of this awesome church is a sample of that. And I want to encourage everybody to please look into it through the Bible. What is the meaning of the resurrection? The end of an old way of life and the beginning of a new one. Thank you guys all. Have a great meal. Aloha.